So we are here in the last session. And uh, the first talk of the last session is from Professor Marco Grilli. And the title is Dissipation Driven Strange Metal Behavior in High TC Superconducting Cuprates. Okay, thank you, Sri. And first of all, uh, of course, I would like to thank Andre and all the organizers of this nice workshop for giving me the opportunity to present our ongoing work on this uh, on this issue of strange metals. So uh, I'm sorry, although I apologize for not being able to to be there in person. I would really have liked to be there. So uh, at this point. Uh, uh, I think probably this is not needed to say what a strange metal is, but just to 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 arrange some the stage. Uh, let me just remind you that for me, strange metal is a metal which violates the Fermi liquid paradigm, and in particular, it displays a, a linear in T resistivity without re saturation at high temperature. And this linearity, when you kill superconductivity, for instance, goes on down to the lowest uh, uh, temperatures. Uh, for some 2D uh, cases, uh, also uh, the linear resistivity is also accompanied by some uh, singular behavior in the specific heat, which can behave as a T log T specific heat, as in some cuprates or in some heavy fermions. Uh, where the strange metal is found? Well, in many, many places. Here are some systems where the strange metal behavior is, uh, is found. And uh, like in the cuprates or in the mictites, this strange metal behavior is found nearby quantum critical points for charge density wave or spin density waves or other critical points like in uh, some heavy fermions. But what I would like to draw your attention to is that uh, although quantum critical points are nearby, the strange metal behavior can also occur on extended regions of the parameter which tunes criticality, like here in the cuprates or in the mitides or here in this overdoped uh, cuprate systems. So uh, what do we need to get a strange metal? Uh, of course, the problem is not solved. So in principle, uh, this is a very uh, uh, personal list, but my idea is that essentially, uh, to have a strange metal, you need two things. The first thing is that we need some scattering mechanism, which is very uh, active, even at low temperature. And therefore the characteristic energy of this uh, mediators of the scattering has to be very small. So it can decrease with the temperature at least. And this is a quite common and natural idea, which has been taken by many, many people and who usually couple uh, fermionic quasi-particles with low energy scatterers due, for instance, to overdamped spin waves uh, or uh, charge density waves. Or more recently, these uh, carriers are coupled locally in a phenomenological way to some extra degrees of freedom, uh, which form uh, an SYK model, for instance. But everything somehow boils down to the idea that you have itinerant particles and they couple to some low energy scatterer. Another point is that to have a, a real uh, strange metal behavior, we need some isotropy scattering. Isotropy scattering means that if we have some scattering which is strong only at some QC, then it doesn't work. The scattering can be very strong, but it is not enough to get the strange metal behavior. For instance, this thing which was pointed out um, long ago by Lubin and Rice simply means that if I have a strong scattering only from one region of the Fermi surface to another region of the Fermi surface, the so-called hot spot, then there remain uh, huge portions of the Fermi surface which are still weakly coupled. In these regions, the behavior is the standard behavior of the Fermi liquid quasi-particles. And this quasi-particles somehow short circuit the transport and dominate the transport. And at the end of the day, you find the Fermi liquid behavior. So it is important that this uh, subdivision, strong uh, division between hot and cold region doesn't take place in the system. And this can be achieved, for instance, with a scattering which is almost isotropic in momentum space. Is there such a kind of uh, scatterer in the cuprates? Well, the answer is yes, because uh, uh, three years ago, uh, with the experimental group of uh, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, 
uh, in a nice collaboration, we found that in the coup rates, the charge fluctuations have a composite nature. On the one hand, at low temperature in the underdog region, we find uh, the usual uh, almost two-dimensional uh, uh, charge density waves, which are related to some hidden quantum critical point underneath the superconducting dome. And these give rise to some um, narrow peak in this uh, bluish region of the phase diagram. But underneath and together with this uh, charge density waves, uh, the experiments identified a very broad peak, which survives at very high temperature and very high doping. This broad peak simply identifies charge density waves with very short correlation length. And just to distinguish them from the longer range charge density waves, we nicknamed them charge density fluctuations. So essentially they are similar objects, but the difference lays precisely in the correlation length. This broad peak is huge, carries a lot of spectral weight. So there are a lot of these fluctuations and they are everywhere essentially in the phase diagram of the coup rates. Then if you take the standard uh, textbook expression for the correlation function of charge fluctuations, this is the standard uh, Gaussian uh, propagator for order parameter fluctuations, which you can find in, the, in any textbook you find that the important parameter here is the mass of these fluctuations, which identifies the minimum energy that you need to create this uh, order parameter fluctuations. And then there is the dispersion, which near the minimum is of course quadratic. And then there is also a damping term, which is here and which will play a relevant role later on, as we will see. But what is important is this mass parameter is related to the correlation length of the order parameter. And the lower, larger, the longer is the correlation length, the smaller is the energy required to create the fluctuation. And this is why from Rick's experiments, we found that charge density waves have a dynamical character, even at low temperature, but their energy is small because they have a long correlation length. While the charge density fluctuations have a slightly larger energy, right because their correlation length is quite short. So uh, this is why in Q space, they may give rise to a broad peak. The interesting thing, thing is that the, the RICS experiment, uh, both in high resolution and low resolution, allow you to determine quite many of these parameters. So essentially, these fluctuations are very well characterized from experiments, okay? So you can get numbers from experiments for this M and for this gamma and for this nu and so on, okay? And the question then arises uh, naturally, could it be that this charge density fluctuation, which are so short ranged and therefore mediate the needle isotropy scattering are responsible for the strange metal behavior in the coup rates? And the answer is actually yes. So if, if you take the charge response function, you see that the charge density wave narrow peak suffer this Lubin and Rice argument. So when you fold the Fermi surface in such a way to my QC in order to identify the hot and cold regions, you find that indeed there is a sharp separation between the hot and cold regions, whereas the excitation due to charge density fluctuations are broad. And when you do the same exercise on the Fermi surface with this pinkish mediator, you find that essentially the whole Fermi surface is hot. So uh, they work as a good isotropic scatterer. And uh, this uh, interaction in the overdoped region where no charge density waves are present, only charge density fluctuations are there, you can calculate the self-energy in perturbation theory. So the effective coupling that you need to fit, for instance, a transport is rather small. The dimensionless coupling is around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So perturbation theory works well. And you do find that the self-energy for the itinerant fermions uh, dressed by this charge density fluctuation has exactly the marginal Fermi liquid-like uh, form. So uh, all the properties of the marginal Fermi liquid as a phenomenological theory can be reproduced thanks to this uh, microscopic charge density fluctuation mechanism. What is interesting in transport is also that this charge density fluctuation have a characteristic energy, omega naught, of order 100, 120, so 10 millivolts. 
And precisely at this energy, which is found with the Riggs experiment, we do find deviation from the linearity. So transport experiments and Riggs experiments are consistent even in the deviation from the linearity. So, and in conclusion, it seems that at least in this uh, regime of uh, temperatures above TC, the superconducting TC, we are done because we have observed well-characterized fluctuations and we use them for transport and simply with first order perturbation theory, we fit the transport, okay, both in the linear and then the upper curvature part. But there is a problem because if you switch on a magnetic field, we know that the linear resistivity goes down and proceeds down to very low temperature, down to two Kelvin in the scoop rates, okay? And therefore, since the charge density fluctuation have a mass of 100 Kelvin, uh, this fluctuations, as they uh, seem to be unable to explain this, uh, this mechanism down to the lowest temperature. So we have to think at something more. So we are facing now a bottleneck because on the one hand, to have a very low energy scatterer, which can explain linear resistivity down to a few Kelvin, we need very low energy. And therefore one is tempted to use a very large size. So to approach the quantum critical point and take an increasing size. But if we take a large psi, then the interaction becomes peaked around QC, and therefore it is no longer uh, in isotropic, and the luminarized argument kills us, kills the uh, strange metal behavior. So what is the way out? Well, the way out can be provided by this uh, Landau uh, dissipation uh, term. So this is the term which describes the fact that this charge fluctuation can decay into particle or pairs. And now, if we look at the characteristic energy of the fluctuation, this is not only given by the parameter M, but it is actually N over gamma. Okay, so this is the relevant uh, energy scale. So we can find a situation in which Xi stays small, so we stay away from the quantum critical point. So we are near the quantum critical point just to have a lot of fluctuations, but we don't go on top of it so that Xi stays finite and possibly rather small. And the small frequency, characteristic frequency is not due to Xi which increases, but is due to some mechanism which makes gamma increase. If we take just by hand, gamma larger and larger, we see that the spectral density of the scatterer becomes smaller and smaller, and therefore we can extend the linear resistivity down to lower and lower temperatures. Okay, so this is the idea. So the main take home message is that instead of using the critical slowing down using the diverging psi, we want to keep psi finite, so we stay a little bit away and possibly over extended region uh, around uh, uh, the critical point and away from the critical point and use some mechanism, additional mechanism, which makes gamma increase. So the question is now why gamma should, be, uh, should become large? One possibility is simply that if you switch on, for instance, a magnetic field, then the superconducting gap is killed. And of course, you have many more particle holes uh, to uh, damp this uh, fluctuation. So the Landau damping naturally increases when you kill superconductivity. But the point is that if we want the linear resistivity to go down to the lowest and lowest temperatures, then we need a larger and larger gamma, if this is the good idea. And uh, therefore we need a diverging gamma. And therefore just to have uh, the closing of the conducting gap is not enough. So we thought at the toy model, uh, just as an example, which is only valid in 2D, to provide at least in one case, uh, an example of situation in which we can realize this uh, increase of the Landau damping parameter gamma. And the idea is simply related to the fact that uh, in any standard metal, even clean metal, you have some impurities. And uh, if you have particle holes 
of low enough uh, frequency and at low enough temperature, smaller than the scattering rate due to impurities, then this particle hole do not propagate ballistically, but they start to diffuse scattering with impurities. And this object here, if you resum this, if you make an infinite resummation of this impurity scattering processes, you end up with a diffusive pole, which can dress the charge density fluctuations, okay? So this is the idea. The charge density fluctuation, again, decays in a particle hole pair, but at low frequency and low temperature, it decays in diffusing particle hole pairs. Notice, as I said, that you don't need to have uh, strong disorder, but just a few impurities is, is enough because all that matters is that you have at small temperature, small frequency, uh, a finite uh, impurity scattering rate. And if you dress uh, the charge density fluctuation with this diffusive pole, then you find that in two dimension, this uh, Landau damping parameter diverges logarithmically with T. So when you decrease T, you have a diverging Landau damping, okay? So for instance, if you calculate in this two dimensional case, the specific heat, okay, thank you. If you look at the specific heat uh, as due to this uh, charge density fluctuations, which are uh, electronic fluctuations, of course, but still you can consider them as order parameter fluctuation, like in the standard Hertz and Millis theory, and you apply the usual machinery to calculate a specific heat contribution due to this order parameter fluctuation, you find that there is uh, the standard logarithmic term and a prefactor gamma. Now, the different thing with respect to the standard quantum critical theory is that usually in this theory, the quantum critical theory is this, is this log which diverges because the mass goes to zero because psi diverges. Here, we want psi finite, so the mass stays finite, and this log term is just a finite correction. But uh, this gamma, due to the effect of this diffusive mode, is dressed, and it is this gamma which diverges logarithmically with t. Okay, so this is just another way of finding uh, some logarithmic divergence of the specific heat, which could match this uh, divergent. Uh, logarith uh, specific heat, which is found in some uh, nearly two dimensional systems like cerium copper six gold and uh, lanthanum strontium copper oxide with neodymium and neuropium doping, co doping. So, what are the conclusions? Uh, in cook rates, the charge density fluctuation work well at high temperature. So, above TC, there is no problem. Essentially, the, we are done because we have uh, uh, fluctuations which are well identified. We, they are experimentally uh, explored and characterized. We use from experiments these charge density fluctuations and we do reproduce the transport, even the deviation from linearity uh, in transport experiments. Now the question is what happens if we want to extend this linear behavior down to the lowest temperatures as it occurs when you, you apply strong magnetic field. Then we need uh, that the Landau damping parameter gamma grows larger and larger. And in this way, one can keep psi finite, the correlation length is finite. So the idea is that we stay close to the quantum critical point, but not too much. And still we can get, thanks to diverging gamma, a smaller and smaller energy and we can adjust this bottleneck and we can avoid this bottleneck having at the same time a small energy for the scatterer and still an isotropic scattering, okay? Now this slowing down of the short range fluctuation is something which can proceed and give rise at zero temperature even to glassy phase. So, so this is something which is somehow reminiscent of what uh, Andy Millis, Jörg Schmalian and uh, Dirk Moore did in the case of qu quantum Griffith phases, where they found that if you introduce the uh, damping, the Landau damping, the instantonic tunneling processes which flip the order parameter inside the quantum Griffith phases, these are made uh, uh, rare, more and more rare 
and they eventually get quenched. So essentially, this is a similar phenomenon. So the take home message overall is that in order to find a consistent description of the strange metal behavior is that we not necessarily have to find uh, to go to the quantum critical point, but we'd rather should stay away so that the large psi is not attained and we keep gamma uh, psi finite, but we look rather for larger dissipation. So this is the message I would like to convey you. And the new idea, since this problem is open since many, many years, is just to try to keep open-minded and try to explore this other possibility, because in this way we can get finite ranges of strange metal and we can get uh, somehow at the same time low energy scatterer and isotropic scattering with this uh, new uh, perspective. And at this point I conclude simply showing the people who helped uh, who worked on this idea, in particular the ancient Roman groups with Sergio Caprara and Carlo Di Casso and the young PhD student uh, Giovanni Mirarchi. Then the ancient Romans were helped by a barbarian from Germany who is Goethe Seibold. And of course, we also enjoyed a lot our uh, collaboration with our friends experimentalists from Milan, Giacomo Giringelli, Lucio Braikovic, and the uh, young fellows, uh, Ying Ying Peng and Ricardo Pang. Of course, the experiments involved many, many people like Neil Brooks, Bert Keimer, Mathieu Tacon, Marco Saluzzi, and many others. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. Uh, let me first take uh, questions from the chat. So, uh, would you like to? So, so I see Piers has uh, has something to say. Piers, would you want to unmute yourself? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Marco, thank you for a very nice talk. Thank um, you, Piers. Uh, one of the things that was observed a long time ago by Serini in Argentina is that in a large number of heavy electron systems that show log c over t, uh, you could parameterize them. Uh, by a prefactor, you could write C over T as S over T star log T star over T. And uh, if you did that, you found that S was very similar for a wide range of materials with different values of T star. Uh, there's a very nice, if you compare, for example, uh, the quantum critical system, uh, uh, terbium rhodium two silicon two with the quantum critical system, cerium copper six gold, the C over T's, when rescaled this way, drop on top of each other with the same prefactor S of order one third log two. And so my question to you is what happens in your theory? Do you get a universal prefactor? Because that's a really important observation in the heavy electron. Yeah. Uh, no, the answer is no. Uh, we, we use the coupling between the, the itinerant fermions and uh, the charge density fluctuations in cube rates. Yeah. Uh, as a fitting parameter. So as a matter of fact, we do find a rather uh, moderate and small coupling, but this is a fitting parameter. So there is no reason in our theory why this uh, uh, coupling, which uh, is then G square is entering this gamma uh, term. There is no reason why this should be universal and uh, uh, be uh, the same in different systems. Mm. Um, I think this is uh, uh, also related to the universal or non-universal debate of the Planckian behavior. So the slope is uh, in the scattering rate is nearly proportional to T with a prefactor of order one or not. Uh, this is an open question as far as I know, and um, I'm glad, I, I, I really would like to understand this better, and uh, definitely thank you for your suggestion to look also at this uh, entropy yep. uh, behavior, universal, so, but, okay, so in our theory there is no reason why this, uh, for instance, the slope of the... This came up, interestingly enough, in the context of a cerium system, cerium rhodium germanium, mm -hmm. and... Uh, which is a ferromagnetic strange metal. Um, and one of the questions was whether the log T was coming from ferromagnetic fluctuations or was non-fermi liquid behavior. And the prefactor was much too big to explain it in terms of uh, a coupling to spin fluctuations 
around the primary surface. It looks more local in character. So the prefactor is a very important signature mm -hmm. of the possible origin of the log T behavior, I think, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. Nice talk. Thank okay. you. We have a question from the audience. Let me just uh, add one thing. Uh, if you use uh, a given uh, coupling G to fit the, um, the resistivity, then uh, essentially the same G works well for the specific heat. So different things seem to be consistent, but this G is a fitting parameter. There is nothing universal in it in principle. But I think the same problem is for SYK models, for instance, um, uh, they also don't have any universal uh, coupling. Is that right? I don't know if uh, Adil Sharpato is, is around, maybe. Okay. okay, can I come in with another question maybe quickly? Um, yeah. I think I understand um, the idea that low-lying charge density fluctuations uh, would give rise to linear and temperature resistivity, but your um, dynamics of the charge density fluctuations, it also has dispersion, right? There's a Q dependence. Um, and so uh, I'm just wondering whether that shouldn't give you a different power law. And the second question quickly was um, whether spin fluctuations in principle would follow the same theory. Uh, yes. So the second question is yes. So the, the, the spin fluctuation would work as well. I mean, if you are close to a spin density wave quantum critical point, the same ideas should apply. Uh, the idea is that you simply stay a little bit away from the quantum critical point. The interaction is mediated by some broad in momentum. And then this comes to the first question. So the, there is a momentum dependence in this charge density fluctuations, but since uh, the the peak is broad. Uh, this means that the momentum dependence is not that relevant. So the prefactor nu of q minus qc square is such that altogether the dispersion is what matters is really the fact that they have a finite mass. And then there is a small curvature over it, which is rather soft, smooth. So it is essentially like an optical phonon, I would say, but it is overdone. Uh, yeah, just uh, want to quickly jump in the discussions that we had with Pierce about the prefactor and the Greek completely that's important. So I take a hat as an organizer and try to connect previous talk and your talk. And in previous talk, when uh, Previ was talking about Garikov Merik Barhudarov, then this expression of TC with Fermi energy as a prefactor, but with scattering lengths instead of interactions in the exponent. And in your case, I guess it's a very similar situation. You start with the coupling. But then nothing prevents you to screen this coupling in a particle hole channel uh, generally and replace it by scattering lengths. And that quantity does not grow if coupling goes up. It's roughly like G divided by one plus yeah. G times some yeah. number. So at the end of the day, you get prefactor for linear in T term, which is some constant of order of one, but constant. Yeah, this is a very good point. Thank you. Yeah, I could agree. Okay, we have a couple of comments from the uh, from online. I'm just going to quickly look at them. So John Cooper, uh, let's see. Oh, we have uh, Chung Hao uh, Chung, uh, who says, I wonder if your CDF scenario also accounts for the Fermi surface reconstruction in the strange metal region near the critical doping of the cuprates, which has been observed in experiments, i.e. the Fermi surface volume changes from a smaller to a larger value with increasing doping across critical doping uh, x critical equals 0.2 uh, and that question. Uh, no in the sense that uh, thank you for the question but uh, uh, let me go back to the uh, other transparencies here uh, you see that there are actually two objects which are present in the uh, in the phase diagram on the one hand there is this broad peak this broad peak uh, as a short correlation length is nearly momentum independent because you see this is really broad momentum space, okay? So it is momentum dependent, but not that much. So the momentum dependence is not important and therefore it can hardly affect momentum dependent uh, properties like the shape of the Fermi surface. What instead is very effective 
in changing the Fermi surface shape are the charge density waves. And indeed, it is uh, quite well known that charge density waves, when they become nearly static in this, uh, can you see the cursor uh, in this low temperature underdog yes. region here? There, you do know that the charge density wave can uh, change the shape of the Fermi surface and reconstruct it in the presence of strong magnetic fields. Finally, concerning the pairing, uh, this broad peak is so broad that essentially indie wave disappears and uh, it is repulsive after all. Whereas the charge density waves mediate a strong pairing in uh, these regions of the Fermi surface in the hot spot of the Fermi surface. Well, sorry, I can no longer change. Okay, so there is a strong attractive pairing here due to the charge density waves. And this can account why the gap, the superconducting gap can be larger here. So spin and charge density wave in the underdoped region and optimally doped region can cooperate for the pairing. But the charge density waves, the picket object uh, here. Instead, if you go here in the overdoped region, where there are charge density fluctuations only, then they cannot neither change the Fermi surface shape nor mediate pairing because they, they are repulsive. Thank you very much. We need to move to the next speaker. So thanks very much, Marco, for a beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you. The final uh, 